success if one person can latch on to a lesson, start implementing it in their life. And I say I'm a success only because if I've communicated it to the capacity and the nature that the scripture reveals that it's put into practice. Now, I've had to kind of put on the brakes because my nature has been to dig through the scriptures and go from book to book and place to place. And in the last, just in the last year, the territory that we have covered together is incredible. But the territory becomes not very impressive if the application isn't made. It's not enough to just hear a message on Sunday and, wow, that we, we never looked at that before and move on. If it doesn't create faith habits that you are implementing, and this is, this is the thing that I think I have really wrestled with, to what degree do I keep stressing something and think, okay, that's enough and let's move on? And then I'm reminded of a gentleman whom you all have known, who insisted on revisiting certain things over and over and over again. He called it the process of denning in and trying to get it into your brain because he knew something that I've had to figure out. And it's good sometimes to have to figure some things out on our own, but most people have very hard heads, very hard heads indeed. In fact, I was discussing the uh, makeup of the brain with uh, a lady physician, and she said, well, you know that most of that is fat up there. <laughs> Sixty-some percent of it. Yeah. Thank you for telling me that. She meant it in the medical realm, and I meant it in the application realm. <laughs> so, it shouldn't be a surprise. I'm going to take you back to Psalm 91. And I want, if there is a capacity to just kind of grab hold of some of these concepts, which I have said are their promises, you know, what, what good is a promise, A, if we never latch hold of it, and what good is a promise if we don't have the confidence in the one who promised? And I think that's really the beginning point of some of these uh, beautiful psalms, what, what value is if we're not latching on. So previously, we have looked at Psalm 91, and we've used the three persons being uh, explained here. We've said that Psalm 91 and verse 1, I said that's the 911 into the psalm. The emergency. If you ever had to call 911, usually the operator says, and what is your emergency? Well, if you're reaching into this psalm, you know what your emergency is. That's the beautiful thing about God, and he doesn't put you on hold for five minutes either. But verse 2 then, that's you and me. And from verse 3, and I think I made the cutoff here. Let's check. Verse 3 through 13, that's what I was going to say. Verse 3 through verses 13 would be that we've called them the heavenly host or the angelic host, the onlookers, who are now talking to you and me, giving us a word, a declaration of God's fidelity, of God's steadfastness through his word. This, is, this here is the voice of of experience, of ones who have gone on before, who have seen firsthand the power and the provision of God talking to us as we have made the declaration, I will say 
of the Lord. Really, it should be, I will say to the Lord, he is my refuge, my fortress. In him will I trust. So a declaration is being made. You and I are declaring. The angelic host looking on. Now giving us some promises. And we have God here. He will also speak a little bit later from verse 14 onward, making some declarations actually to the angelic host, not speaking directly to us, strangely enough, but to the angelic host, who then has also been communicating to us, but God is watching. So it's an interesting group of speakers. And as I said many times, if we are careful to understand this psalm contains many promises to the saints contingent upon this one thing, the proclamation. He is my refuge, my fortress, my God, in him will I trust. It means I'm running to him and leaning on him, that word there for trust. I am leaning on him and I make God my stay. Now, in verse 3 last week, and I don't want to revisit that lesson, I tried to point out the fact that there are different dangers for the saint of God. And God, in that case, we're, we're being told by the angelic host, surely he will deliver you. And I wanted to at least make sure it was understood that we have said, I will I will rely on God, make him my refuge and my fortress. And still this person somehow got into what we've described, the snare of the fowler, the, the lure or the bait of the trap or the trapper. So verse 4, I want to tackle this today. I'm going to do the tough stuff up front, and then I'm going to take you somewhere else. Verse 4, he shall cover thee with his feathers. And under his wings shalt thou trust. Now, this is the unfortunate thing with the King James. If you see our declaration in verse, tr verse 2, in him will I trust, that's that Hebrew word to lean on, to place all your weight, and it's being translated again, trust, except here it's running to the refuge. They use the same English word to translate two different Hebrew words. His truth... And some of you should have, most of you, if you're reading the King James, should have italicized, shall be thy. Everybody have italics in your Bible? Added by the translators for the sake of continuity and translation. So those are not in the original. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. So I want to do, as I said, I want to do the language part first and get it out of the way that I might be able to take you somewhere to make the application. Now, for those of you who have been watching at home, some of these uh, morphologically tagged verses 1 and 2, 3 and 4 available to you uh, through the download as we did our Hebrew lesson. How many downloaded that Hebrew lesson? A couple of you. Okay, the ones that didn't, I'm telling you, we did a pretty phenomenal introduction to Hebrew. If you want the lesson, I highly recommend that you download it. It will help you tremendously to understand and put some meat on the bones of what we're going to do today. So, let's begin here. I've put the Hebrew on the board, verse 4, and I just want to make a few points and show why I have chosen to guide some of you through at least the very beginner's introduction to Hebrew verbs. You're going to see what's interesting about this. Um, so, with and the root there, with his, and um, King James says feathers. If you're a lexical person, it will say pinions, and it will actually say pinion singular. Um, feathers is okay. And then something interesting here. Um, I need to look at what the King James says exactly here, he shall cover thee with his feathers. This is the verb to cover in the Hebrew, and 
I would like, now you'll see why I said if you want to do the, the Hebrew lesson, some of you who didn't, you may want to. It'll help you to understand. This verb here in the Hebrew is causative. That means essentially what it's saying is, if I may translate it as if it was, we weren't dealing with English as the first condition, he will cause. That's what causative is. You're going to be using, he will cause cover. He will cause cover to you. And I just want you to pause on that for a minute. The interesting thing and why I've, I'm looking back at this when it says, he shall cover thee with his feathers, you can read right by this and not recognize that it is God that is co causing the covering action on you. So many times we can try and reach and do a promise and think, well, what, what must I do to appropriate this? And I've said back there, verse 2 is our stay, that proclamation, my refuge, my fortress, my God. So, he will cause cover to you. He causes it. And I want you to just note something right here. I put these little markings on here because somebody asked me if there were no chapter and verse, as I mentioned a few weeks ago, if there was no such a thing in the early days, what might it look like? How would we know where the breaks are? And I just happened to pick this up out of my office. So forgive me, it's a little bit heavy. There's a lot of different markings. You're actually looking at what is called the Leningrad Codex. Uh, it is probably dating from um, about 1008. There's an earlier manuscript to this, which would be the Aleppo Codex. But this one at least shows you you, you, wouldn't be, you would not have been able back in this day to say, turn in your Bible to uh, chapter and verse, because there was none. So, uh, <laughs> word to the wise, when folks like to debate and say, the inerrant word of God, which is the King James Version. <laughs> Hello. So why did I just bring this up? Because one would ask, well, how would I know where the pauses were? Chapter and verse did not exist. And I'll show you. These little tiny diacritical marks in the Hebrew mark a pause designed for the reader reading the Hebrew text to stop. And like a comma or a breath mark, it would actually act as a place where you would not only stop to breathe, but you would also stop to reflect. So with his pinions, and I'm going to put the plural in there, with his pinions, he will cause cover to you. Pause. Almost like think of that without the sila attached. All right? And, and under, and under his wings. And I just would like you to consider a few things because we can get so poetic in disseminating and taking apart this beautiful psalm that we can forget what it is actually communicating to us. And I want you to take the words under his wings for a minute and just hold your brain on what I've said. In the Old Testament, there are several images of the wings of an eagle. In Exodus 19, and then again in Deuteronomy 23, Moses will talk of how the Lord bare the people, how he delivered them on eagles' wings, the strength, the flight, the mechanism to deliver them. In this particular case where we're looking right now, we see under his wings, that is, I want you to see the subtlety just in the, in the language being used that if I was to say how he delivered them on eagle's wings, we would be talking about the deliverance, the strength, the capacity versus here an image of vulnerability under the wings, protection, warmth, safety. So even these subtle language marks help us to illuminate a picture 
And then if you go right to the end of the Old Testament, you read in Malachi where it says, the son of righteousness shall rise with healing in his wings. So it's those, one day I'll do a sermon on in, under, and on because they all have some dimension of God's deliverance and the beautiful imagery that's given to us. But I don't want to go, I don't want your minds to go so poetic that you fail to make the application because we can paint this beautiful picture we see these, oftentimes, these National Geographic or um, wilderness pictures where there's the young chicks, the young birds are shaking, they're in the nest, they're vulnerable, and the mother is protecting. So it has this imagery, but I want to make the application today to something that you can walk out of here and actually use, seeing it's not that far from where we actually are. So, with his pinions, which I'd also put a footnote here and say, some translations say shoulders. With his shoulders, I prefer pinions or feathers. He will cause cover to you and under his wings, you will find, you will find refuge. Now I want you to take note of something. This word for refuge is from the same word I just referenced, hasa. I just referenced that word for refuge, which if you were reading, forgive me, I'm going to grab my Hebrew text. If you were reading, you would see the same word is going to be appearing in verse 2. My refuge, same word. This will be a reoccurring word, in fact, through the psalm. You will find refuge. Sometimes the translation of trust erodes the imagery that we need today, which is we are, we are running to something for protection. And here's the good part of this, because it really bothered me. I said that politely, didn't I? It really bothered me. Your King James says his truth, and then you've got the italicized, shall be thy shield, and buckler. And it really bothered me because, first of all, I know what a shield is, and buckler normally is another word. So I said I was going to get the tough stuff out of the way first, and then we'd go to the, the application. So let's look at this. This word, this marker, is out of ink. This word right here, which is being translated shield, I want you to take note, and please write this down. It is different from the typical word we find in the Hebrew for shield, which would be magin or magin. That is just a regular shield. This word right here, tzina, is a whole body. It's a shield that covers your whole body from head to toe, not just some little uh, Captain America disc, all right? But a big thing, all right? Just thought I'd wake you up. Some of you may be in comic land. I'm not quite sure. So it's a whole body shield from head to toe. And then this conjunction, and. And here's this marvelous word. Now, for you grammarians and for you uh, students of theology, they call this a hapex. Legomenon, which in layman's terms is a one-hit wonder. It only happens once in the Bible. You'll never find it again. So this word, it will help us tremendously to understand that the Septu Septuagint in the Greek defined this word in a verbal manner, as if to say surrounding or encompassing. And if you trace the root of this word backwards, you will find exactly that. It will have surrounding, encompassing, encircling. So let's write here, let's write encircling. We'll use a kind of verbal form. And then, of course, amito, his, his, that is God's, amito, which comes to us from obviously the word amen. And in this particular case, is being used to state his faithfulness, his steadfastness, 
Truth is encompassed in that. And I, I want to point this out because it will become crucial to understand this word, I have good reason to believe, A-M-T, amet, comes from amen, comes from amir, his spoken word as well. So when God says a thing, his fidelity is at stake. It's his word of promise being communicated to us. So if you take all of this and say, now how do I put this together? And by the way, this is uh, indefinite, so it is a shield. So I would translate this with his pinions or his feathers. He will cause cover to you, you speaking of you and me, and under his wings, you will find refuge. If a person was wanting to know what this verb entails, it's a simple action. You Hebrew learners, it's call. But for those that are not into the grammar portion, let's just call it a simple act of faith. Faithing. You will find refuge. And the way I've translated this is his faithfulness. His faithfulness will be an encircling shield. That is, your whole being will be encircled by his faithfulness. Capture that, and you've got a most incredible promise. 26 translation. Some of you may have that. And I'd like to read a few of these that are being translated the latter part, his truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Some of these translations sound like this. His truth will encompass thee with armor. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. His fidelity is your assurance of security. I like this last one. His faithful promises are your armor. like it a lot. Because if we were trying to capture what is being said, his faithful promises are your armor. Think of it now. He's given you this promise to the one who is making him your refuge. You'll find refuge. And your fortress, you'll find refuge and covering. And my God in him who I, I will place my entire weight, as I said, of anxiety, of care, of concern, of need on him, he becomes, his, his faithfulness, his ametness, if you will, becomes a whole protective armor around my whole entire being. Now, you may walk out of here and say, well, I don't feel very protected. And I would simply say to you that all these things are appropriated and activated by faith, not by sight. You may say, well, I don't, I don't feel different. So, and if you don't feel different, that's not my problem. <laughs> <laughs> now, because I can't find anywhere to write that's clean, we'll just have to write over what I've already done right here. So we're going to break this into some divisions here. With his pinions, he will cause cover to you. And I've called this the divine action. And under his wings, you will find refuge or shelter. I've called this the human need. And the last part here, which is that God's faithfulness, his fidelity, his steadfastness to his word will be an encircling shield to you. If you want that last 26 translation, scribble that somewhere. This is the divine manifestation, this portion right here, to the human condition. Okay, I got all this information down now. What do I do with it? I'm going to tell you. I want you to turn to the book of Ruth. That's right, book of Ruth. 
right after Judges. In fact, the book of Ruth was part of the book of Judges, uh, initially included as part of the book of Judges. Now I want you to, while you're turning there, I'm going to paint a picture. See, it's real easy to get caught up in the poetry. And I, I don't mind that, because you can drift away, and in your imagination, you can paint, I said Hebrews pictorial, you can paint the mental picture. But if it remains a mental picture, and you never place that picture into your life, it just remains that, a picture. So I want you to take this verse 4 and envision the fact that if we were staying on a concept of vulnerability, the need for protection, the need for provision, sometimes we will journey through the Bible and not make something superimposed. And I want you to take this verse 4 and see how it fits over the book of Ruth. If you're not following me yet, it doesn't matter. I'll make, I'm going to make it make sense to you. I'm determined. It came to pass in the days when the judges ruled, first chapter, there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. Obviously, they had two sons. The sons took wives in the land of Moab, one by the name of Orpah, the other one by the name of Ruth. And at a certain time, as it happens in the story, we have Naomi's husband dies, and the two sons die, and that leaves her with her two daughter-in-laws. And verse 8, Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house, and the Lord deal kindly with you, as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. And I want you to keep in mind that these women, these uh, two sisters, were of the land of Moab, and we can certainly deduce that they were not necessarily familiar with God's ways or God's laws or God's provision. We can, we can deduce a certain amount from where they came from. The Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, lifted up their, they lifted up their voice and wept. And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters. Why will you go back with me? In essence, I'm not able to have any more children. I can't bear any more sons. And even if I could, would you wait around for those sons to be old enough for you to take and to marry and so forth? So after much pleading, Orpah kisses her mother-in-law and leaves, but Ruth cleaved unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back unto her people and under her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. And I want you to underscore this because it is the hinging of verse 2 from Psalm 91. Whither thou goest, I will go. Whither thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. Now, I want you to just take a second to see that Ruth had no certainty of her future. She had no certainty. In fact, it would be safe to say that in the big scheme of things, she was not only vulnerable, but if you were just looking at this in the culture in which they lived and existed, it was pretty bleak. So for her to make this declaration, a Moabite woman, no less, to her mother-in-law, your, your God shall be my God. Where you lodge, 
And by the way, that word for lodging, we found that in Psalm 91.1, that lodging for the night, that place where when the night falls, when the darkness comes. Thy people shall be my people. Thy God, my God. At the moment she made that declaration, she essentially was saying, I will say to the Lord, my refuge, my fortress, in him will I trust, my God. She was essentially making that declaration. So I don't want people to say, well, is, is the declaration of verse 2, must we say it like this? No, it's, it is that anchor of the soul. It's saying, just as she says, just as Ruth says to Naomi, your God will be my God. And so firm a declaration, she stands on that. So these two women journey back to Bethlehem. And it's kind of interesting, as they see Naomi coming into town, they said, is this Naomi? She said, call me not Ma Naomi, call me Mara, which is the Hebrew, bitter, for the Almighty, that is the God of provision, Shaddai, hath dealt very bitterly with me. Now, you know, again, so many lessons in this book, I just simply say, when you think that God is not providing. I want you to remember this depiction of Naomi who said, Shaddai, the God of provision, hath dealt bitterly with me. Why? Because her husband and her sons now gone, and all she's left with is this daughter-in-law. But little did she know that God had a plan and provision laid out. This is the thing when, when we when we do make that declaration of verse 2, when we do say, the Lord is my fortress, he will cause cover to you. You may not see it initially, but he will cause covering to come over. His covering will come over you. She says, I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Pretty sad sack. Pretty depressing. So Naomi returned, and Ruth, her daughter-in-law, went out, came to Bethlehem in the beginning of barley harvest. Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth. And of course, Ruth now says to Naomi, not knowing about this man named Boaz at this particular juncture, who he was or where he might have been, she says, let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him, in whose sight I shall find grace. And I find it very interesting because I, I absolutely am certain of this. The Lord was guiding, the Lord was providing and clearing the way for her to find her way to Boaz, her kinsman redeemer. But I'm sure she did not know it. Just the ability to have food on the table a frightening prospect for these widows. Of course, if you read the Levitical law, you see very plainly that in Leviticus 19.9, there were the laws of gleaning that extra were to be left along the edges of the field so that the poor and the stranger could come and glean. So maybe Ruth wasn't completely ignorant of God's ways after all. So she is now going and gleaning in the field. In verse 4, it says, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. They answered him, Lord, bless thee. Then said Boaz unto his servants that were set over the reapers, Whose damsel is this? Now I want you to see protection, provision. I hate to use the word providence because I don't believe everything is wound up, but see this picture. The servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, It is the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. And she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and hath continued even from the morning until now, and she tarried a little in the house. And then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter, 
Go not to glean in another field, neither go from hence. Do not depart from here. Don't go work in another field. Stay here, but abide here fast by my maidens. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? Again, so subtle, because we can read right by this and not see the culture, that it would have been highly probable had she not had someone to protect her what might have happened to this woman. So we have wings of covering for a vulnerable person, protection and provision. Boaz also says to her, if you are thirst, go into the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. She fell down on her face, bowed herself to the ground, and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes that thou should, shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath fully been showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband, how thou hast left thy father and thy mother, and the land of thy nativity, and art come into a people which thou knewest not heretofore. And, and see why I have connected these. Boaz says to her, The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. I wanted to give you an image, rather than being so poetic that you can't even make the dot of, or the connection of what it looks like, it's right here. Under whose wings thou art come to trust. You know what's so beautiful about this? Boaz is talking to her as a completed action, as if she, she has trusted in, and therefore because she has trusted in, she will not be left uncovered, unprotected, unprovided for. This is a superb application because it has no poetry to it. We only see this woman journeying off in a land. It seems as though she has had such bad luck. Now a widow, now having to take care of her widowed mother-in-law and in a land unfamiliar. And yet see the provision, see the grace of God. And I love that, that Boaz says to her, the Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. Thou art come to, right here, to take refuge under. Same word. So next time you say, I, I need to reach into God's book and take a promise and make an application that will be not only something that you can bank on. I want you to, I'm going to continue in Ruth, but I want you to get the imagery. I said, I'm determined to communicate this one promise to you that for the declaration she made, your God shall be my God, not knowing what we know now. Standing on that verse 2, I have this wonderful promise of God causing cover to me, having protection. I always think of under the wings. I think of warmth when it's cold. I think of shelter. I think of everything that conjures up under the wings, under the underneath part. But most importantly, his faithfulness to his word will encircle you, your entire being, as a protective armor. So when we look at Ruth, you see the application. And there's only one criteria. Again and again, I have to just kind of put this back into perspective. There's only one criteria that God is asking for, that you take him at his word, that you trust in him. And when I say trust, it's encompassing the fact that he has stood on his word, he's given it. It's, it's his spoken word that has become his faithful and steadfast word that you then stand on and say, amen to. That's why I have no tolerance when you go into churches or hear people like, amen, amen, amen. They don't even know what they're saying. 
Because the amen of God is the fidelity, the consistent ability to grab hold of what God said. And despite the circumstances, look at Ruth, despite the circumstances, the Lord not only provided, provided for food on the table, provided protection by way of Boaz, but also provided a kinsman redeemer. Now, I love the book of Ruth. I've always loved the book of Ruth. I think I love it even more because it makes this wonderful promise come to light. I've often asked myself, why is it so difficult for us, hard-headed ones, to see the divine action that God promises to meet our human condition? By nature, do you realize by nature we spend most of our time even the faithing band, the, one that, the ones that are exercising faith, we spend most of our, our time in flight mode instead of, and I say flight as in fleeing from rather than fleeing to or running to the speaker and his words. If you remember, we looked at the word obedience. That is running to the voice of the sayer. God's still looking for that in us. Now, the beautiful thing is that nobody schooled Ruth on what needs to happen in great detail. She made a declaration, she stood on it, and the Lord, through the mouth of Boaz, says, under whose wings thou art come to trust. Now, let me read on a little bit, because I like the beauty of this book so well. He treats Ruth with kindness. She gets to eat at his table, is given a gift to return to her mother-in-law. And um, I like this. This is probably one of my favorite things in this book. In chapter 3, Naomi, her mother-in-law, said unto her, My daughter, shall I not seek rest for thee, that it may be well with thee? And now, is not Boaz our, our kindred? With whose, handmaid, with whose maidens thou wast. Behold, he went with barley tonight in the threshing floor. Now this is mama telling her daughter what to do. Wash thyself therefore, anoint thee, put thy raiment upon thee. That's good, at least she got clothes on. <laughs> Get thee down to the floor, make not thyself known unto the man until he shall have done eating and drinking. And then, of course, He'll be slightly merry, verse 7 says, when his heart was merry. I guess that means he was happy. <laughs> Never mind. He went to lie down at the end of the heap of corn. She came softly, uncovered his feet, and laid her down. Came to pass at midnight. The man was afraid. <laughs> man was afraid and turned himself. He said, who art thou? Hey, you know, listen, I want you to... <laughs> That's why I said, don't try and imagine this in the King James English. Who art thou? What's remarkable about this, and every time I've gone by this, I've always said the same thing. It strikes me as a little bit interesting that he went to bed merry and then he wakes up afraid. Uh, <laughs> he turned himself and behold, a woman lay at his feet. He said, who art thou? Now, don't think modern technology and go flip on the light switch. Had a candle in the corner of the room or something, or some wick-burning instrument, he would have been seen but faintly of what was at his feet. Who art thou? She answered, I'm Ruth. I like that. I'm Ruth thine handmaid. Now, I have to put a footnote on this, because every time I've gone over this, I've made light of this, but I really want you to be with me. Harness your brain to be serious about this. Spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid, 
for thou art a near kinsman. And I want you to catch a picture of something. The Hebrew word for the spreading of the skirt is the same root as the wings. Until I had studied each individual word, I had failed to see that what is being said is another concept, another layer of covering. The first one, of course, is that verbatim uh, re repetition of this. But this second one is the way it would be revealed, it would be telegraphed, it would be said that in the process of the spreading of this garment, the same, word, same Hebrew word as, as for wing, would be the telegraphing of indeed coming, she coming to the point of saying, you are my kinsman redeemer. Now he does tell her, he says, you know, there, there is somebody closer than I in terms of being able to redeem you, to take you to myself. There's somebody else. And he says, he'll go and inquire, and if the, if, the, if the one that is next of kin or close of kin does agree to do so, fine, and he will, and if not, Boaz says that he will redeem her. And that's simply being said that her name would continue on, that her family would continue on, and of course he goes in the morning and comes to the kinsman. That's in chapter 4. And he basically says to him, this is the scenario. He said unto the kinsman, Naomi, that is come again out of the country of Moab, selleth a parcel of land, which was our brother Elimelech's. And I thought to advertise thee, saying, buy it before the inhabitants, before the elders of my people. If thou will redeem it, redeem it. If thou will not redeem it, then tell me that I may know. For there is none to redeem it besides thee, and I am after thee. And he said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, What day thou buyest the field of the hand of Naomi, thou must also buy it. In other words, now you're not only taking the field, but you've got to take the mother-in-law and the daughter-in-law. And then, of course, the, the kinsman redeemer says, That's not so appealing anymore. That could ruin the possibility of me giving my inheritance to the right place. So he tells Boaz, No, you, you do it. Now, the beautiful thing about this is that if you are reading the genealogies, you'll trace back that under the covering wings where she found refuge by declaring her mother-in-law's God would be her God, Elohe or Elohi. A declaration of God's word settled in heaven was noted, I'm sure, an onlooking band watching as a declaration was made in a promise that then transcends through the genealogies to become great grandparents in the line descending to David. So when you want to talk about somebody who's out on, down on their luck, as we'd call it colloquially, and needing some covering of God, don't limit your mindset in this promise to simply that he will cause covering to you under his wings and refuge and encompass you. But take with it this depiction of Naomi not only shows protection, provision, and a promise of God, but through that promise, a line that descends to Christ, to our Redeemer, to our true kinsman Redeemer. So, in the big scope of things, what I'd like you to leave here today with from this is not only Ruth as an application, because we may find ourselves not knowing, like Ruth, picking up and we don't have a prayer of an idea, whether it be because of the economy or because of the nature where we find ourselves, we don't even know where we're going to end up. You'd be surprised how many people will say the same thing, oh, I'm anxious about tomorrow, I don't know what's going to happen. Well, find yourself in this promise right here. And unlike Naomi, who didn't have the equipping and didn't have the knowledge, you have something certain to hang on to because you have made him your stay. Cling to just that one word, if you may. My God, my God, for that staying, he'll cause cover to you. And don't think for a minute 
some of us have erroneously over the course of time said, I don't feel anything just yet. Do you think Naomi, as she went out to glean in the field, saw the covering of God just yet? The answer is no. And I'm sure looking back, the heavenly host, looking back, that by the way, I would have to say, this heavenly host right here would include Naomi, would include Ruth, would include Boaz, would include uh, Obed, would include Jesse, would include David, who are all looking on and saying, this to you and me, take note of the fact we took refuge, took note of the fact that God gave a word and promise to take note of the fact that we, the onlooking heavenly host, are encouraging you to make God your stay. And for that, if you want to use the words out of Ruth, your reward, God will cause cover to you, protect you, provide you. That is his paternal promise to you and to me, for us to reach into this and say, I take this. I need refuge. I can speak as one who's needed refuge in the past from the assault of people, whether it be verbal or we've had a thousand different things happen where you just say, I need refuge. And I've run to that refuge, not initially knowing, except that God caused cover to me, and he'll do the same thing to you. He's asking for one thing. I'll say it again, that you trust in the giver of the promise and that giver of the promise will not go back on his word. His word, anchored in heaven, tethered to you on earth, waiting for your faith to appropriate it. If your need today is that, covering, protection, that promise is yours to take. Claim it in Jesus' name. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.